Hey, John here. Let's talk about something we call an address space. Another name for it is memory map, okay? What this describes is what the memory of the machine is used for when a program is running or a process, right? Now, let's look at it in terms of what all the bytes are used for in the machine. So you can draw these in different ways. One way to do it is to say, look, the memory whose address is the lowest value, the first byte in the machine, whose address is zero by definition, right? Uh, the whole memory is just an array of bytes, logically speaking, right? We could sort of draw a rectangle like this and say, look, here's all the bytes. This box represents all the memory in our machine. The very first byte down here at zero, what is it used for? Turns out that's used for text. And we'll see that's not, you know, words in a document either. The last byte would be the one with the highest address up here. Now you could call that address like 99999 if you wanted to in decimal. But in reality, we usually work in hex when we're working with address spaces and memory maps. So the highest digit in base 16 is F, right? F, 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 and so on. For however many uh, uh, digits you have and your memory space. Nowadays with 64-bit computing, there would be a total of 16 Fs in here representing the highest possible address. I'm not gonna write all 16. So that's why I just put the dot, dot, dot there, right? And there would be 16 zeros representing the address, the very bottom of memory, okay? So the idea here is that when a program is running, this address, the, the, the region down here, we call this part, uh, the region of this address space is where the executable instructions go. And by convention, those instructions, the data that represents those instructions is referred to as text. After that, we have a region that's actually called data. After that, we have a thing called the BSS, all right? These two things go together. Combined, that is where we place all of what we call uh, uh, static scope uh, variables. All right. If you don't know what those are, we'll look at a little bit of a code in a, in, a, in a minute, and we'll show you what this is all about. Now, the, this is differentiated into two parts. The data region are those items that have non-zero initial values. And the BSS is zero initialized. Now, these are, this is a minor point. It has to do with saving space, right? It turns out that, let's divide this into two sections, okay? The section down here, this purpley color, represents the only part of your program that needs to be saved anywhere on disk. In order to run this program, right your executable file this is what's in it right here all right i'm going to put quotes around that because there are some you know tweaks and things that the operating system might do to adjust your executable file when it puts it into the memory but the bottom line is the executable instructions you know obviously it needs to remember that right this is the stuff that comes out of the compiler when you compile your program this is the data that represents the executable file if you have a bunch of variables that are global variables, another way to think about this static scope variables here, these are the variables that are global, all right, in your program, among other some other items. But for the most part, these are the global ones, okay? So if they're initialized to zero, then there's no reason to use up all that disk space for all these items that are zero. You only have to remember the data items for those things that are not initialized to zero, okay? So quite often the BSS is, is fairly large. You'd probably want to write your program so that if you have a, a bunch of global variables and their initial values don't matter to you, set them all to zero because it saves you on disk space, all right? Especially as this thing gets really big, okay? All right, so after that is a thing called the heap. 
All right, and this starts out empty, and it grows upward as needed. The heap is what gets filled in. This is your what's called the dynamic uh, storage. All right, and what goes in here is anything that you create by using the new operator and that you delete later on with the delete operator. If you're in C++, that is. If you're in C, the analogous operations are called alloc, or more like malloc, and uh, free. Okay? So anytime you allocate or new something, a little spe uh, space of memory is reserved out of the heap. If the heap isn't big enough, it doesn't have any extra space, it grows upward forever. This thing can eventually overflow and run off the top of memory if you're not careful, right? Eh, it's not too bad if you have a 20 or a 64-bit address space. You've got 4 billion squared bytes uh, in, in your whole machine. Hopefully, you wouldn't run out of that amount of memory, okay? Now, at the very top of the memory growing down is what we call the call stack, or the program call stack, uh, and it grows down this way, all right? Every time something gets added to the call stack, it, it gets pushed into here, and this thing grows down like this. So it turns out that in a call stack, this is the top, okay? And I'll put quotes around it because this kind of looks like it's the bottom, but what's really happening is, in order to organize the memory efficiently, as you increasingly put more stuff on this stack, having it grow down this way, right, into this unused area, works quite nicely, and having the heap work up this way also works quite nicely. This is not exactly drawn to scale. This here is usually got about two to the 63 uh, uh, power of bytes in it, which is a very large amount of empty space in here. So this can grow quite a while, and this can that, in theory, right? Of course, you don't normally buy this much memory. It can only uh, grow as big as the memory that you own. Now let's look at some code to find out what ends up going where, okay? Uh, what we've got here is a little hex dump library that I wrote. And we include the usual I.O. stream, I.O. manipulators, and some standard int definitions so we can create things that will be of a known size. And what we're going to do here, we're going to create an A1, an A2, and an A3 uh, variable in here. And look what's going on. If I don't initialize a variable at all that is a static uh, storage class, okay, by default, this will be initialized to zero. If I don't say, okay, this is only true for things that have a static storage class. They have to be initialized to something. If I don't say, it will be zero. If I do say, and I set it to zero, it will initialize it to zero anyway, and it'll still end up in this BSS region where the zero initialized items all end up. I can create a whole array of things, you know, a hundred element array. Again, if I don't give it any initialization at all, it'll end up initializing that to zero. So those three variables are going to end up in the BSS. If we go down here and I create some two other variables, and I do give them initializing variable values, okay? X1 is 1111. Let's make it, uh, uh, let's initialize it to nine, because what's going to happen is I'm going to show this to you, and you'll have to see these in hex. You'll be able to recognize it if I give it a value that we can recognize. Um, uh, here's X2 uh, is a 20 element array. Each element's going to be four bytes in size. I'm going to initialize part of them, but not all of them, right? So the rule here is I've initialized 13 of these, right? Zero through 12, 13 in total. Elements number 13 through 19 that I did not initialize here will be initialized to zero, okay? But because some of the elements are initialized, this entire array will end up in the data region because it has an initializer value, value uh, as well this X1 down here, okay? Now I got a subroutine called func. This thing here will end up in the text region, and whatever the instructions are that the compiler generates for this 
subroutine to actually do whatever it's going to do, the printing here and the adding of one and so on. Now, I explicitly created a variable in this func subroutine that is a static storage class. That will forcibly place it into either the data or the BSS region, okay? I've given it an initializer that's not zero. Therefore, this will end up in the data region, okay? And it'll be initialized to one because it is a static storage class. If you create one of these inside of a function, what happens is that this i variable has the same scope as any other variable would have inside this function, right? It's only accessible between the open curly and closed curly within which it is defined, okay? That is the, uh, the, the, the scope of that variable. However, because I said it is static, it doesn't get reinitialized, reallocated every time function gets it invoked. It stays and it stays whatever it was last time it was called. So if I add one to it like this and then return, if someone calls func repeatedly, what'll happen is the first time func executes, it'll say i is one. It'll then increment one i to two. If I call it a second time, it'll say i is two increment it to three. I ain't call it the third time, it'll say i is three, and it'll increment it to four, right? Because this is a static storage class, right? All right, now, what else are we doing in the main? I hex dump out uh, a1, x1, and just for fun, I dump out the instruction binary codes of this function. Now, this is kind of screwy. Uh, we don't need to go into this right now. The bottom line is what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out the contents of this variable, that variable, and a, a not really a variable, but a function that exists in the text region. And the, and the point here is we can see what the values are of these various things, and we can see where they actually are located when the program runs. All right. So let's compile this. And uh, let's do this. NM, which is a utility function that comes with the operating system. And we're going to sort the results. Well, we don't need to put it in a less. It won't be that much output. I can just scroll back here. So what, ha what did I do? What I did is I said, I want you to tell me all the names of all the symbols in this executable program. In other words, what are all the labels? What are the variables called? What are the subroutines called? And also tell me where they're going to be located. All right. Now, I asked it to sort the output so that the results will come out in numeric order. We'll see in a minute here. All the stuff that comes up out here with blanks to the left, all right, what, what this is, uh, down here, uh, this thing is an address expressed in hacks where something with this name or label would be, like that might be a variable. It turns out that's actually an executable piece of code that initializes the program, all right? The stuff that's undefined here, all these U's say, hey, you know, this is stuff that has to exist for my program to run, but my program doesn't itself contain these items. What these things are, these are a bunch of subroutines and, and data items that come from the operating system. So this is what I said earlier when I said, you know, yeah, the operating system can adjust the program uh, while it reads it in and puts it into memory. What it does at, at, as it loads it off the disk, these are the things that connect the program to the operating system, all right? And it's uh, libraries and stuff like that. We're going to ignore that for now. We don't really care about that. What we do care about is this. Look what's going on in here. This is a relatively low number compared to, the, you know, these numbers down here are higher. So what do we got? We have a thing called init, a thing called start, some other stuff, do this, global that, frame dummy. All of a sudden you see a funk V in there and you see a main. This is my funk subroutine. It's what we call a mangled name, but that's a, a C++ thing. It's how they deal with overloaded functions. It's beyond the scope of this discussion. Suffice it to say, that is what we call funk in a C++ program. This is the main function in my program, okay? These numbers here are the addresses where those ins executable instructions are going to be 
in my program, okay? And there's some other junk in here, oh, oh, operating system stuff. You finally see some sort of finish thing. You see some other stuff. These are a bunch of library routines and variables and stuff like that that are used to deal with uh, what, what looks like printing and things like that, all right? These are just the mechanics. Again, some operating system stuff that came along from the uh, compiler and you see some initialization routines and some stuff global offset tables and all that fun stuff and then all of a sudden we run into something that says data start be a couple of different ways of saying I, here's the beginning of your data there's this thingy here it's an operating system thing it stands for dynamic shared object probably uh, it has to do with loading things in libraries, shared libraries off the disk and so on. But then we see something we recognize. Those are my X1 and X2 variables that I declared and I gave initializers to. So these things are in the data region, all right? It says this is marks the beginning of the data region. It starts at 4,000 in hacks right there. Here's my X1 variable. It would be stored here at this address. X2 would be stored at that address. Look what this thing is. Another, we recognize our funk again. You see that little eye hiding over here? Again, this is an angle, a mangled name. This is that static eye variable that's inside that funk subroutine. Because it's static, it put it in the data region along with these other global things, right? Eventually, we see another thing that says, oh, by the way, we're done with the data region now. That's actually what this variable here says. But look at these numbers here. The BSS starts where the data region ends. Now we have the BSS in here. Some operating system stuff. Okay, great. See something related to the C out. So this is you know, obviously some printing routines or something like that, Okay. Then look and see what happens. We see my A1, A2, A3. These are my BSS zero initialized variables in my program. Some more operating system stuff. And finally, it says end. So this is the end of my object module, my, my executable program on the disk. All right. And this is where all the stuff is. So let's run it now and see what happens. So what happens? Uh, remember, it called funk three times. Let's cat out the program here. Make sure we all remember what it's supposed to do. Remember, funk is here. It had this static uh, variable inside of itself that printed it out and added one. Every time it was called main starts, we called it three times. Okay. So when our program runs up here, we see I is one, I is two, I is three. Okay. That I variable is not reset every time because it's static. We then go back to the main routine. Let's go back and look at our code. And I dump out using a library that just does a hex dump given an address. So this is how we say this uh, print out the contents of the uh, memory starting where the A1 variable is for however many bytes that A1 is consumes and do the same thing for X1. And then I just guessed at how big main was. You can't say size of main. It, that doesn't work that way. So I just said print out 100 in hex bytes, which is 256, okay? So let's see what the dump looks like now. So what happens? It says, here's your A1. Well, that's interesting. It's this massive address. I said it was going to start near zero. And this up here said it would start near zero as well, right? Look at this number here. It's a bunch of blah, 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 blah. And then it says FA220 for a variable A1. Look what A1 says up here. A bunch of stuff for 220. So what happens is it kept everything in the order that it said it wanted it. But rather than starting it at zero and using these numbers here, what it did is it took the entire program, lifted it up, and slid it way up high in memory. Relatively speaking, this is up high, but it's certainly not, you know, infinitely up there. Uh, this isn't a lot of digits in here, right? How many digits do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then 9, 10, 11, 12 digits out of 16 digits. So there's, uh, what, four missing hex digits here. Relatively speaking, all right, now this is a big number, but relatively speaking, 
that's a, 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 a somewhat low address, okay? And notice that this one starts at uh, this, this number, FA220, and then this thing comes along and goes to FA020, all right? Remember what we said, the uh, BSS, which is where the A variables went, because they're zero initialized, and you know that because you can see the zeros right here, go after at higher addresses than the X variables that did have initialized. Remember I said I was going to initialize X1 to a 9? Well, there it is, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 9 in little endian order. Now, we just said dump out the executable instructions, whatever the hex bytes are that represent main at this address. So look and see what's going on here. See this uh, F72B0? That number is less than this number, which is less than that number. And if you look at these values and you look at the distances between them all, that does roughly match what's happening up here. So what, did, what, what happened? Well, the operating system decided that it didn't want to run my program all the way down here near zero, okay? It decided to put it somewhere else. It moved it up some. It's okay. The OS can do anything it wants. But, of course, in doing so, right, it consumed up a lot of memory down, uh, down in the bottom. So this shrinks down how much space is left for the heap and the stack and so on. And that's okay as long as I don't run out. But that, again, is totally up to the, uh, it's the prerogative of the operating system. So what do we learn by this whole thing? We've got different regions of memory. When your program runs, different things go in different areas. Uh, resources are finite. Okay, and the compiler slots all these items into those regions. You've got your executable code in the text region. You then have the data region here for initialized variables. You have the BSS for variables that are zeroed out when the program starts running. And then the rest of the um, um, memory is used starting from here all the way up to the end of the memory for the heap and the program call stack. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.